Hello and welcome to Thoughts on Talks with Reverend Mike McMorrow and me, Malena Dawn. And we are here for the purpose of discussing and maybe dissecting or digressing from the Sunday talk. And in this case, that was Sunday, June 14th, right? Yeah, I'm looking at my calendar. Yes. And uh, the topic was Mavericks, something about Mavericks. Uh, yes, so mindfulness for Mavericks is our theme for June. The theme, oh, for all of June, okay. Right, and our talk title was, um, uh, oh gosh, I just had it when you were asking me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just wandered off. These are the things that happen when we think we know it, so we don't have the notes in front of us. Yes. But oh, wait. I do. You do have the notes in front of you. Very good. So everybody should think like vamping music in their head. Mindful, in mindful intentions. Mindful intentions. Yes. Very good. Oh, look at that. You do have the notes. I'm prepared. <laughs> Well, the, and I, it, when I was there in person to see the Sunday talks, I would just grab your notes off the lectern yeah, the at good the old end days. of the Sunday service, and then I'd have them. So we haven't been able to do that for a few months now. Well, and uh, my talks Our, were better then, too, because between you and your mom, I had a nice little... Uh, laugh track up in the front <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah yeah and i'm kind of putting them out there and i look over the musicians and they're like <laughs> not funny oh no they're probably well, thinking about their next uh you know their next right yeah. anyway Your focus is on something else yeah. so I will say that I was not feeling very well yesterday. I think my allergy medicine hit me especially hard. So my memory of yesterday's talk is fuzzy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you get to tell me what I should remember from it and anybody else watching. Nope. <laughs> well, we can start out with the... Uh... The idea of uh, mindful intentions. I remember, I do remember you talked about what is a maverick. Uh, well, maverick, I think, was last week. Okay. And I had the image of John McCain. Hmm. Yes. Yes. The but I remember, you think, maverick. I remember you speaking about it this week, too. Okay. Because um, I think of James Garner from the TV show. Right. And I think of the remake of the movie Maverick with Mel Gibson and yeah. James Garner and Jodie Foster. And I think of how um, Sarah Palin kind of adopted that as part of when she was campaigning to be vice president. She really loved that Maverick idea. Yeah. Well, technically speaking, she was one of those yeah so it's, it's it's someone who takes a departure from the expected uh you know sets their own path yep all those things so if you're a, a mindful maverick you're setting your own path with mindful intention Thoughts. well yeah this, well the theme of course is mindfulness for mavericks okay. And so what I take from that is uh, basically a reminder. So yeah. we may be independent thinkers and wanting to set our own path. And yet at the same time, uh, we don't have to be a reckless maverick. Yeah, um, or be different for the sake of being different or just, you know, contrary. Right. So... Or even if you are different for the sake of being different, you can be uh, thoughtful as to how you go about doing that. So, anyway, right. that's the way I take it. Sounds good. Right. And then, of course, the thing that I always, where, where the word maverick for me goes is to that 
giant set up north of up in Half, uh, Half Moon Bay here in California. The okay. one place where we have Hawaii size uh, waves. Oh. When conditions are right. Hmm. In really cold water. <laughs> right. We don't have the Hawaii warm water here. No, it, they're amazing. Those, uh, the, the guys and a few women who take on those waves. I, I can't imagine because just the shoreline waves in Hawaii, like the little five footers mm -hmm. compared to California. Yeah, those things are crushers as it is. So. Yeah. And you think of them just because they are, are kind of blazing their own trail or is, is that area really called Maverick? Uh, yeah, the, well, the wave itself is called Mavericks, okay. and uh, yeah, I, I don't know why. Maybe because the, the waves themselves are kind of uh, rogue waves. You know? Yeah. So, excuse me a little bit. My computer is telling me that I need to <laughs> plug it in, which it already is. Really? But uh, anyway. And it's still telling you that? No, I just... I flipped it around and okay, in fact it may have stopped recording there for a little bit mm, I don't know I think we're all right okay good um oftentimes when I think things are plugged in and I get those kind of warnings it's plugged in where I'm looking but it's not plugged into the power source right well that's what I was doing while I was trying to talk <laughs> about that wave <laughs> but anyway I think we're good now <laughs> So um, I guess t plugging into a power source actually ties into what we're talking about, which is, you know, when you're looking at these rogue situations, we need to plug into our power source to make a mindful choice. Correct. And move forward. Nice segue there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So last week we, we spoke with, Nancy Woods and Salam Thompson yes. uh, about last week's theme, which is just breathe and what's happening in our world with the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, kind of heard their background. We're going to be hopefully talking to them again later this week in a separate episode for those of you who may be watching this, waiting to see <laughs> Salam and Nancy pop up to continue the discussion. Um, and so for, for the idea of being a maverick, I can see that tying into marching in a movement that is changing the way that we do everything, really. And, um, and to be intentional about the choices we make as we navigate the world with with these things in play, pandemic and Black Lives Matter and just creating the new world with all of these new factors. And uh, I found it challenging myself just in conversations online with friends around the world on Facebook. Um, most of the people that I know are marching or commenting or entering into conversations and it's been really great to be connected with people around the world doing that in Sri Lanka and in Denmark especially um, New Zealand but uh, it's been harder for people it's been harder for me to deal with people who seem to be not understanding the importance especially when they're not in America to try to explain the whole history, all of American history, and how it adds such import to this moment. So. Well, there, you know, I would suspect that if you're in Europe or another country, I don't know if it's still true, but you know, America has always been held up as the place to go the place to live because of the it's the land of opportunity and right we've always had this mythos of 
the Horatio Alger story, uh, which is now the the Bill Gates story, where you start from nothing and you know, and to some extent that that opportunity is uh, can be there. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it helps if both of your parents are corporate lawyers and you're smart enough to get into Harvard, like Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you do have the, the outlier story also of those folks who can kind of navigate it. And, and uh, so I don't know if folks still hold out that ideal or that myth uh, for America. I don't think so. In the last several years, I think it has become quite tarnished and more and more people are saying America is not the place to go. America isn't the innovator and the leader in, in the ways that they used to be seen, we used to be seen as. Um, and I know for black people in the, like when I watch historical fiction, television shows, um, in like the 20s and 30s, it was maybe even 40s and 50s, it was better for them to maybe go to France and they would have more freedom and be, um, you know, less. Right. Well, Billie Holiday went there, among right. others. Yeah. Because of how terribly they were treated here. So, uh, the Western world isn't always on the same page with, with things like, you know, moving forward and recognizing everybody as equal. Oh, it's just different here, right? So Europe cast off their aristocracy and we're trying to build one. Right. Right. And yeah. Not that there weren't. So for instance, one of the things that with the Confederate statues being pulled down, mm -hmm. right? So, so part of the pushback was, well, you know, Washington and Jefferson and 11 of the framers, they were all slaveholders. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. However, they were British subjects and second class citizens within the British system. Washington was the largest landowner in the United States. Hmm. So uh, to equate taking down their statues with the Confederate generals mm. who went to war against the principles set forth in the Constitution, which up until the in the Constitution, but most in and the Declaration of Independence, which they everybody knew they were doing a sidestep around the rights of Negro slaves at the time. And they had some of the most heinous legislation around that. Mm. With the, uh, what was it, the three-fifths? That the slaves could only be counted as three-fifths or whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, my history's a little uh, hazy there. But this idea that all men are created equal, which is one of the tenets of the founding of our country, and it's the one that people love to, you know, rally around the flag about, and this yeah. is the key to the issue, that this just has not been the case for a portion of our population who are some of the oldest families in the United States, who've been okay. here, some of them, since the, since the very beginning of the very first colony, since the 16 and 1700s, and the only reason why they have no record, or the only record they have are slave documents. Yeah. Right? And then to have the Civil War, which everybody wants to like paint as, oh, it was about states' rights. That's absolute bullshit. Because it was about it was about disenfranchising slaves. And it was about and the economic slavery. system. That was I'll built. tell you something else. It was also about fighting for an aristocracy, which was what these plantations owners were. They were aristocrats. And so we had an English system in our country 
that was supported by slavery. Yeah. And I do not understand why people are so willfully ignorant about that. And I don't know why I'm getting so worked up about it. But, but it's, well, it's, it's, it's been wrong from the start. And here we are, you know, 200 years later. I feel like these people, you know, when Mary Ann Williamson first started talking about reparations mm -hmm. and the, the, the debates, and I'm thinking, well, that's kind of crazy. How are we going to do that? Right? Mm -hmm. And then the COVID hits, and then all of a sudden they can find two or three trillion dollars to pump into to everybody's pockets. Yeah. Right? And one more time, the corporations are getting these gigantic influx of cash, which we have no idea where 500 billion of it went. Yeah. Right? Just like we've had all these wars and not raised taxes. The fact of the matter is, is that we can do it. We've just yeah. lacked the will to do it. And so to mm -hmm. your point, and I think this, you know, if it is Gen Z plus, Whoever's, whoever is taking to the streets, I think it's, you know, like I said yesterday, part of it is that we've been stuck at home and we don't have football, baseball, all the various all the distractions. Distractions. Yeah. And we're hopefully for the first time having real discussions around the dinner table about what's going on, the way that we did in my house growing up about Vietnam hmm. because that was on the TV every day, every night. Right. And we lived in a military home. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just knowing that these conversations are happening, that people's hearts are softening. Hmm. Uh, and at the same time, I, I suspect Salam may speak to this a little bit on Wednesday. The a concern of the dilution as we try to get all these other, well, what about me groups also? Yeah. Right? So that the real impact that we can have for the African-American community to address this, mm -hmm. and, and not to say that uh, that all people of color they, every, everyone matters, but, right. but there's only been one segment of our population yeah. that was consciously kept in physical bondage. And then with Jim Crow disenfranchised, right? So we're seeing voter suppression and disenfranchise right now through the Republican Party, mm -hmm. Republican states. But it was the Democratic Party who set up Jim Crow. Yeah. To specifically disenfranchise black voters. So I don't blame them, man. Yeah. I mean, police brutality is the tip of the iceberg of a very deep systemic issue that I hope, I hope that we are prepared to really do the hard work to heal it. Yeah. Right? Because really, when we address uh, what is happening to those who have been most injured by this poorly built system, I'm going to say, even if it was consciously built, it wasn't built with the highest integrity. Uh, it helps all of us. All of us will be assured of equal treatment. All of us will be assured the whole society is lifted up when we help those who need it the most right now, which is black people in America. Well, and, but I think we also have to look at it also from a conservative perspective, right? So part of the, and, and this is, I don't know how valid an argument this is. Okay. Um, but we also don't want to depend, we don't want to build dependency into whatever the reparations are. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, that's where it's a whole, it has to be it, a many pronged approach. 
So it has to include education and it has to include uh, opportunities to use whatever the reparation is, assume, you know, assuming it's funding or land, whatever, right. uh, to, to create sustainable uh, business wealth. Correct. All of that. A access, to access to home ownership, the best yeah. schools, not secondary schools, uh, the best neighborhoods, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. It's the best thing for the country, too. Yeah. This really should be a no-brainer. Yeah, it should right? be. Uh, because within it is opportunity for all of us. Because I think the other thing about this, and I don't know if maybe I just should speak for myself, but, you know, there is the European American and then there's a Black American story, the African American story. Mm hmm but in America, it's our story together. Yeah. It's really only one story. Yeah. And um, so what I'm doing is I'm just trying to educate myself mm -hmm. on things that I don't really am not all that excited to learn. I'm not interested in hearing and learning about the way that I get defensive about talking about race and how when I do certain things, they're, they can be racist. Mm, I'm, yeah. not, I'm, I'm reading, uh, so that's uh, Robin DiAngelo, her book, White Fragility. Mm. That's what she calls it, the pushback about that uncomfortableness. So I spoke to it in that way yesterday without calling it white fragility because we don't like hearing that. That's un-American <laughs> to be fragile. Right. The other thing is this guy, or the other author is uh, Ramesh Manakam, who's written a book, My Grandmother's Hands. Mm. He has an interesting take on it because he's really coming at it from this like pan-global perspective of we as a species, as homo sapiens, and our us against them uh, biological consciousness that's in our very DNA. Yeah. And that we're all carrying around this unhealed trauma within us. Mm -hmm. uh, encoded within us. Yeah. And uh, I've just started reading the book, but man, mm -hmm. it's a very interesting idea. Like, yeah. A lot I've been of pointing out to white supremacists forever. I said, so, so you understand that in the beginning, Homo sapiens were black. What are you talking about? They, hey, man, if we came out of Africa, what color do you think we were? You need yeah. to get over this stuff, man. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, going back to the building of our nation, that in order to justify slavery, you have to pick some theory. You know, they had all these theories about the you know superior races and all these things you have to come up with something to justify such horrible choices and that the justification is what's still with us it's a, it's a dehumanization and uh, hatred of difference of somebody who looks different than us and that justified slavery it justified owning a human and um th that it's been passed down from generation to generation that hatred is still within so many families and people who haven't been exposed to uh, just having a friend who has a different skin color because they weren't they weren't raised in the neighborhood that had that that's one of the things Salam said last week that really kind of struck me because I've had black friends all my life from school and from work and from, you know, everything, all my singing projects and everything. And he said that most, for most white people or most non-black people, they only encounter black people in white spaces when black people come into white spaces. 
So I thought about that. I was just fortunate enough to grow up that way, that I live in a very, you know, mixed part of Southern California. So it's, you know, kind of specific um, to America. It isn't representative of all of America. Um, and I think it's a lot of, because of the things that were instituted from the civil rights movement and into the 70s, where it was a promotion of like, let's all mix everybody together and let's, you know, let black kids come into white neighborhoods to go to school, the busing thing, and, uh, and setting it up and affirmative action and all of those things were instituted. And I never saw or was aware of it as a kid. I just knew that we had kids of every color in my classroom. And um, so it just normalized it for me. It was just the way life is. But I didn't, I was never pushed to go out of my bubble and try to find a neighborhood that was different than mine. It never occurred to me to do that. But it seems like maybe that's one of the steps that needs to be taken now is if we're not going to wait for black people who have felt kept out of white spaces to come in because it may not be a comfortable or safe thing for a lot of them to do how do we go into their spaces and make that normal i mean right. without, without invading without without creating a gentrification problem right like yeah pushing people out of their neighborhood or making and them feel like they're being saved by you know it's a uh, and of course we had this whole conversation yesterday set against the teachings of religious science right so i kind of did a little play on words around because if you recall that second slide said all demonstrations are complete when when you set into motion through the law of mind appears in form that's basic mm -hmm. religious science talk all denomination or demonstrations begin as thought that the power of intention is a demonstration of our faith in the invisible substance of life. And of course, again, I keep bringing this up, but these were all set up a year ago. And here we are with all these demonstrations going on in the outer world. And, and yet it is, as I was pointing out yesterday, it's the thinking behind all of these issues. It's the thinking behind it that needs to be raised and yeah. shifted and lifted. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to be putting lipstick on the pig again. Right. And nothing lasting is going to happen. It feels like it really comes down to greed that people would be willing to subjugate other people to keep all the wealth for themselves, which is where Centers for Spiritual Living has the hashtag a world that works for all is the antidote to that thinking that there is enough for everybody, especially when we all work together and share and help each other. Uh, but how to go from one mindset to the other, like right now it feels like there are two camps that are very different and the the people that are hoarding and greedy are afraid that there won't be enough, so they don't want to let go. They're amassing wealth, and it, it almost seems like the one who has the most wins, even though they can't take it with them when they die. Um, and on the other hand, there's this progressive movement to help communities come together and work together well, you know i'm going to push on that just a little bit okay because i don't i don't know that it's greed per se okay um and i'm saying that knowing that the grease that makes the wheels of capitalism turn is in fact greed mm -hmm. or uh, unenlightened self-interest okay right which is based in fear mm -hmm. of not having enough right Right. But for most people who've accumulated some kind of wealth, you know, they've done that within a system. 
mm-hmm. a system that was designed by uh, powerful people that I don't think they, like, for instance, I don't think there's some Antifa or even deep state thing. It's just life is evolving and changing and this is kind of where we found ourselves because we created a system that did not acknowledge that we're operating within a closed system right that the markets were you know expansive and would go on forever mm-hmm. kind of thing right uh, and uh because when you think of the world that our parents and grandparents built after World War II, mm-hmm. which were very conservative people. They survived not only World War II, but the Depression before that. Right. right? And yet they created, a, uh, through the New Deal, post-World War II, having seen the effect of fascism and authoritarian governments and the destruction of Europe and Britain Mm -hmm. uh, sat set out to create a more perfect union now as it happened you know we needed toasters and refrigerators and cars and TVs and you know all these various things that we manufactured at the time Mm -hmm. But, but in the 60s there's this shift again this is to me is a consciousness thing where yeah. Milton Friedman comes along as a the uh, influential economist, where before there was a social contract between corporate uh, corporations and um, society, mm-hmm. and because there, there was it was an understanding that uh, one needed the other. And that there was a responsibility within the corporation to help provide for the social good. <clears throat> Friedman comes along and says, no, the only purpose of the corporation is to increase value for the shareholder. And of mm-hmm. course the shareholders went, yeah, great idea. And then, <laughs> so, and then they cut tax rates and did all this other stuff. So the truth is, is that we've been living in an underfunded system yeah. For 50 years, unless we are going to war. Right. So, so the value and the power is the energy and focus is put on the wrong things. I'm going to call them the wrong right. things. And, and so even with something, some of the more admirable things that we, that were, uh, that came out of the 60s, Mm -hmm. like the Civil Rights Act, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, But if you, you know, as I think back and as a guy who's getting ready to enter my working life at that point, all of a sudden there's not enough money to do anything, Mm. right? So we had the war on poverty, but it was kind of an, it was underfunded. Right, and then we had with Clinton, we had welfare welfare reform, which shaved off, uh, which made it m- more difficult. So, for instance, to have to have a man in the house and to be on public assistance. Okay. So, hmm. anyway, I'm just I don't think it was any big nefarious thing. I think it was right. just kind of. This, How it develops. Right. And I think people of color have been a political bargaining chip mm-hmm. back and forth, really starting from the way our country what came into being. Yeah. All the way to where we're at now. And, and so, so now what be- needs to happen is those African-American professionals, right? So, uh, You know, those who got in were able to get in and maintain themselves in the middle class and their children who were educated and now have have, uh, taken their place now need to have a seat at whatever this table is, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, at government, in finance, uh, 
uh, on in the corporate boardroom, on the school boards, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the uh, in the housing authority, uh, just everywhere. Yeah, and not from a um, it, it, well, just it's just time. And yeah, we have to figure out a way. <laughs> And, and to know that we're going to go into it and there's there's a negotiation that's coming up. Yeah. And, but I, hopefully it will be in a way that has a timeline that, you know, has 20 years to it. Yeah. Uh, so that we can really address it. And, and to have, you know, the thing that we've learned since 2008 is that home ownership turns out to be the one way that families can build a sense of wealth mm. and um, African Americans have been systematically cut out of that yeah uh, even still today I hear stories of discrimination that are heartbreaking yeah for renters right mm-hmm so anyway because we have the like i think reverend nancy was saying we have we have laws on the books that need right. to be enforced <laughs> yeah that's part of the trick so to, to take it to that consciousness perspective again um when you are brought up in a system and you're you you're taught this is the way it is and you're just going along uh, and then we have a time like now and like the 60s where things are shaken up and it's time to pay attention to other things. That, that feels like the evolution of a species. It feels like uh, the growth wouldn't happen unless there was some kind of shake up because otherwise, I don't know, the, everything reaches some kind of mass level where it's unsustainable Correct. to just keep doing things the same way um so for a consciousness of humanity to evolve um you know i'm always trying to think of how do we reach the people who don't seem to agree with that who really are holding on to whatever we, I tell you, there's really only one way. And first of all, first of all, to continue to promote and to teach what we teach. Mm -hmm. So within our denomination, mm -hmm. right, we have to continue to vision and to know a greater truth. Mm. That there, that not only is there a power of thought, but it's a power of thought that is accessing that which has unlimited power. Mm -hmm. Unlimited imagination, uh, uh, unlimited um, resources, right? And that is ultimately propelled by love. That that mm -hmm. is the that really what we are calling into being now mm -hmm. is the healing agency of love in its highest forms, the kind that Jesus spoke about, mm -hmm. and that we need to invite it to be not be busting everybody's chops about whether they're having sex or who they're having sex with, right? Mm -hmm. But rather to bring in, to love my neighbor as myself. The second yeah. greatest commandment, right? And, and the thing is, is that you don't have to, you can be an atheist and embrace that one. That's, yeah. that's the genius of the Christian uh, proposition. You don't have to believe in the son of man and all this other stuff if you if you can't but you can you know you can believe and love my neighbor as myself which means that uh what the way holmes put that was um when the time comes that nothing goes forth from from our thinking other than that which you would be glad to have back in return mm. right then you will have reached your heaven so in other words, the way to create heaven here on earth is to have a vision of life for ourselves, and then want that for my brother and my sister too. 
Yeah, because if everybody is happy and everybody has enough and everybody has the opportunity to go for their own personal goals, then they're not trying to take it from somebody else. They're not uh, act, enacting violence. They're not fighting with each other. If, if everybody's happy, everybody's happy. <laughs> well, and the thing is, is that, so we may have a finite resources as to, you know, how much coal or petrol is available. Mm -hmm. But apparently, so long as we all agree on whatever, whatever's holding this money supply thing together, apparently there is enough. Well, money it's is a, a, it's a essential a construct too. Right, so it's a distribution issue, mm -hmm. right? Because we're, we're somehow able in this human race consciousness unconscious agreement mm -hmm. that we are creating value within this this system in some way right but it's not tied to gold anymore it's not tied to any thing in the material world it is a it literally is a thought form yeah and so what is required is for us to think differently and again from the deepest levels of compassion yeah, uh, that teach, you know, this idea of teaching a man to fish rather than giving him a fish, but making <laughs> sure there's a fish there for him. Yes. Because there's plenty of fish. And right. this, is, this is really the issue. I mean, we haven't been able to meet and do flourish in the way that we have been, but this, this really is the key to the whole thing. Yeah, I was thinking what that. What we're doing is not sustainable. Right. Part of this coronavirus thing is that we have close to 10 billion people on the planet now. Yeah. All right. We need to figure out what is this sustainable number and mm. to find a natural way to get to that. Mm -hmm. Because... The fact of the matter is, as the dominant species on our planet, we're eating everything, literally eating everything in sight. Have you read this book, Sapiens? No, but you've mentioned it a lot, so I, I have the really, list. It's just talking about, because what he's talking about is the power of consciousness. He doesn't okay. call it that. But yep. our cognitive ability, and one of our first abilities was to be able to construct story and a story that unites us yeah right and how we use that to to work our way this is um as hunter gatherers emerging out of uh, africa mm -hmm. to populate the entire planet including including the pacific islands and australia now, one of the things that he points out is that for the first tens of thousands of years, the stone tools that we created, all they did was break open bones so hmm. that we could get to the marrow because we were still, we were still the, we were still prey. We weren't yet the predator. Okay. But, you know, so what happened to the giant sloth and what happened to the, horse in America, what happened to the, the mastodon and the uh, mammoths, right? We ate them. We ate them. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, I mean, we literally have been eating our way through history. And that was fine when there was just, you know, a million of us scampering around on the surface of the planet. Right. And I'm not yeah, going to um, go back to that, but rather to use it as a wake up call because uh, the, the next extinction is going to be us. Yeah. Well, if you think so, of it, we, I have heard it described that we are the virus. <laughs> Humans are the virus on this planet. But we have consciousness. But we have consciousness. And, uh, you know, if we look at the coronavirus, it's hard for us to pin down the science of how to, how to work with it because it seems to have the ability to change. 
which maybe we haven't really embraced as humans, our ability to change. I mean, that's how we've survived all this time is that we can survive in any climate, that we can adapt, that we can, uh, because of our consciousness, we can invent tools and invent, I mean, I, the, the computer language and science fiction, it's all inventions of our imagination. Science fiction takes off where science reality leaves off. It's theoretical. All of it is an expression of consciousness. And all of our life is an agreement that, you know, what we see means this and how we interact means this. So it's time for us all to open our minds and lift our level of consciousness to see what we can create together when we try to create together. Um, well, we and have, I think, I'm sorry, go go ahead. Ahead. finish your thought. We have that opportunity and we have the ability to create new ways of doing things. And so when I was saying, you know, if we're not fighting with our neighbors, if we're not, you know, trying to stamp out violence because everybody's happy, then we can all work together on facing the challenges of the environment. And it is all connected. <laughs> the environment and how we treat each other and commercialism, it is all connected because it's all us. It's all from our consciousness and our, our choices. Yes. Yeah, so how to create that thought form mm -hmm. that is the contagion, right? The contagion mm -hmm. that shifts this. So to me, if, if we, because part of the thing also with this racial question, if we can heal this, mm -hmm. I think really what it is, is it's just this big ball of resentment, unhealed resentment on all sides mm -hmm. right and justified or not right because uh, if you think about resentment leads to distrust mm -hmm. uh uh well and and to eventually to war and certainly a, a mentality that's at war with itself in many ways right one of the things that some of my friends uh, around the world have been talking about is how this is ancestral healing, that we have to go back through the, the pain of our ancestors and look at uh, colonialism and slavery and all of those things that dehumanized our ancestors and how that came through us, whether it's through our DNA or our um, what we were taught, the culture that we came up and out of. Um, and that's, you know, healing the earth and healing our ancestry really takes us back to origin issues of like looking at the system from the very beginnings and rebuilding it as it maybe should have been, but could certainly be recreated now. But I like the idea of the ancestral and it's one of the things that, um, have you watched uncomfortable conversations with a black man on YouTube. No. It's a former NFL player, Emmanuel Acho. Okay. And he's done a couple of videos now. And the first one he addressed questions that white people have asked him, his white friends. And the second one was with a, a conversation with Matthew McConaughey. And uh, they're both in Texas. And uh, that's one of the things he said is this is like, ancestral rage coming out from the black community. And he said, actually, um, he feels black is a better word than African American, because for most Americans, they their African descent has been stripped. So they can't say I'm a Nigerian American or a Kenyan American. They are just American. They like you said, they've been here since the beginning of the country. But there's this specific ancestry has largely been stripped from them. So he said he prefers the term black. And so the conversations are interesting and, and, and the connection to our ancestry, I think is, is part of the 
healing that needs to be done because as we focus more on individualism, Americans have gotten disconnected from their ancestry. And it's just another way to sort of replant ourselves in our roots, our like trees, you know, nature and ancestry both have the roots in the earth and there's healing that needs to be done on all those levels. Right, but you know, <clears throat> even this idea of the individualist, right? So mm -hmm. early sapiens, you know what happened to the individualist? They died. He got eaten, right? So mm -hmm. we actually are genetically built to work together. That's the truth. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so we need to dismantle, you know, that rugged individualism. You know, if you read the, the People's History of the uh, United States by Howard Zinn, mm -hmm. he talks about the suicide rates of these uh, sod farmers out in the middle of the plains by themselves living in these sod houses. That nobody ever talks about that. Right, or a woman whose husband uh, is killed and, and she has a baby and here she is stuck miles and miles from anyone else. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a, there are some tough rugged. I do not I do not know how people made it across the Mojave Desert in a in a in a wagon. I mean, I just drove out there. But they and, didn't. And I'm out in Baker and I'm going. Who the hell could take a wagon? A wagon? Well, there's no roadway. But nobody did it by themselves entirely. No, there yeah. were wagon trains. There were, you know, they took supplies. There were groups of them. The smart ones had some interaction with the local native people and got some help, some I mean, assistance. They were tough, tough, yeah. tough people. But we're not that. No, we're not. We are soft. Have, like, there was a TV show for a while where Americans would go and live with tribes in different parts of the world. And I, <laughs> really? it was a, like a National Geographic show. Or oh, man. And I watched one episode and it was an African tribe and I don't remember what country or culture it was. It was like probably more than a decade ago that I saw this, but they interviewed, you know, like one of the tribal elders and he said, these Americans are very, very soft. <laughs> that, you know, that just the act of going to get water and bringing it back or hunting or any of this, the people who signed up thought that they were pretty fit and capable. And they had a hard time keeping up with just the basic life of the tribe. Yeah. But eventually they, bo they bonded and, right. um, you know, it, Every episode had a, a beautiful story of connection and growth. And do you, you remember the name of the show? This sounds really interesting. National Geographic. I, I'll have to look it up. I think it was National Geographic or Discovery Channel. And I think I saw it when I was living in Sri Lanka. So because I, you know, you and I both have have, have had immigrant experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember my. Uh, in the late 70s, visiting and staying with my Irish relatives in in Leitrim, mm -hmm. and uh, it, and it was definitely Spartan compared to American standards. Uh, yeah. But at least they had electric lights by that time. Yeah. But uh, when I think back on my aunt Marianne. Uh, raising, gosh, I, I want to say nine or ten children. I, I'm not sure how many. Uh, out of this small cottage, uh, you know, with turf, with a turf fire, and you know, water from the well, and that's the way. Many, many, many homes were. And you were lucky if you had a well. Otherwise, you had to take a trip to wherever the water was. Well, you know, in that's Ireland, right. the well is actually pretty easy because, you know. Okay, good. Hold a cup out the window. <laughs> <laughs> it rains all the time. But, but okay. yes, it's not like, let's say, in Africa where we see the stories of, you know, the two or three mile trek. Right. To the water hole, you know. Which is why most, throughout most of history, you'll see that 
cities and communities pop up closest to rivers and lakes and bodies of water because it's survival. And you don't go far away from it unless you need to for some reason. I guess nomadic tribes, if they're following the hunt or the seasons, what's available in different climates and different zones. Yeah, it's, it's an it's interesting, a it's very interesting to consider. Um, you know, one of the things that's, uh, I'm kind of chuckle at myself because I got like five books going right now. And they're all really interesting. And, um, but uh, these, I feel like I really kind of have a duty to educate myself. Yeah. About the, um, to the extent that I can. I'm not really looking to, to get in touch with the, with the black experience per se, mm -hmm. because I know that that's something that I can just kind of get a glimpse of. Yeah. Uh, but I am interested in hearing how I can make things better. Yeah. In a very real way. And more yeah, than absolutely. just, you know, more than just talk, but you know, yeah, or as know. a faith leader, you know, right? So, because for me, it's always a, a balancing act, and I so appreciate on the Zoom call somebody mentioned openly uh, uh, that they appreciated that you know we had a pastor who was willing to speak to these issues on a Sunday, right? And for me, it's like. I would much rather talk about it's a friendly universe and it's abundant and let's get out there and and get out of our own way and make it happen, right? Uh, but this has always been the great paradox about religious science is that we live in an infinite, in a field of infinite uh, possibilities for good. And I absolutely do believe that. Mm -hmm. right? And yet at the same time, we are the hands we are the hands by which spirit does its thing here on the earth now mm -hmm. so and even if you believe in the second coming of jesus which that's not one of my things but i know many people do then up until then we got to do the heavy lifting until he gets here because right. i think it, to think that Right. So to stay with that model, to, to think that we have all the intelligence, all the resources, that we have plenty of everything that we have been given here, and to not think that this mess we've created is not ours to clean up. It is ours to clean up. Right. All of ours. You know, once yeah. in a while, your mom might come in after wading through your clothes for you know, as a team, and just kind of close, would be willing to close a door for four or five weeks. But at some point, you know, you're going to run out of clothes, or you can't wear that shirt one more day, and you're going to have to get in there and clean things up. And so you yeah. might get, you know, mom might come in and help, you know, get the right, because she can't take it anymore. Right. And, you know, we're not teens and mom's not coming in. No, our and loving parents on high to help us sort all this out. Right. So our, our really loving good. parent gives us inspiration yeah. is, the, you know, the divine is our loving parent that gives us the inspiration and the will to take action and the hands and feet and minds and mouths and fingers to type and all of the things we need to do those things and we just have to connect with that and act it's just the heart to bring it forward too yeah exactly it's um i don't know it's it's an interesting it's an interesting time to be alive I, i'm kind of you know i hope that uh certainly by the time my, my hitch is up that uh I get to see some forward momentum. I, I'm tired of apologizing to my son for the way things are. Because, you know, in, 
in the 60s and 70s, it, it really looked like we were going to make, you know, like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, we can change the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we are. Well, there was, a, in my memory anyway, it seemed like there was, things were pretty good for the 80s and most of the 90s. We had a nice period of, it seemed like everything was good for a lot of people and, you know, but everything changes. N nature, the nature of life is that nothing stays static and uh it has to shift and change so there's it's that paradox loop that we're always riding to shift and move with time and energy and change so we'll just do our best and know that we are not alone in doing our best and taking the actions that we are pulled pulled by our vision to to take and, and we're called really to investigate and maybe update that vision that maybe we haven't revisited for a while. Yeah. And so, and for those of us who are in spiritual community, whether you uh, are here physically with us in Granada Hills or are joining us in cyber spiritual community, right? Just find a way and to make that commitment for us to do it together. Yeah. Oh. That is the value of spiritual community that you are no longer all by yourself out in the wilderness. Right. You and, have support. Yeah. And that, uh, in fact, to that end, if you're still watching this and after some of the subjects, uh, we've talked about you feel like you need some prayer support. <laughs> Is that coming through on, uh, can you read that this way? I can, but okay. I like how you flipped it over in your Facebook thing on Sunday, just in case. That was yes. Tough. Well, and I like the way you said, what was it you said? Oh, I've, I, I've, I've seen <laughs> signs from both sides now. I've looked at signs from both sides now. That's what I posted, yeah. Because Very good. I Prayer support. Wait, let I me read it out loud for the, put it back up. I want to read it out loud for those who are just listening on the podcast. Oh, okay. So for prayer support, you go to www.cslgh.org. That stands for Centers for Spiritual Living, Granada Hills, cslgh.org. Or you can email Rev Mike, R E V M I K E, at dslgh.org. You're doing a good Kilroy was here with your nose over there. Right. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, I did, and when you get there, and soon you'll be able to see our new and dynamic and updated website. Yeah. Which it's almost have, ready for launch. That Malena has been working on diligently. It really does look good. So you Thank got you. Canada, you, you got some of the uh, you have a lot of those little bells and whistles and stuff. That's all in there now. So yeah, it's starting to uh, starting to look real good. And of course, the bane of every website designer is what folks she needs information from us so <laughs> yes uh, so we're kind of the hold up right now so i will get on the troops all so. right yeah very good yeah i i'm i'm aiming it for the beginning of july to be live so everybody can see and uh do you have a date uh, a target date for people to start coming back in person or is that still in the works? Gosh, I don't know, man. It's a moving target, isn't it? Yeah, I'm waiting to see what happens with the numbers uh, post-protest now. Yeah. Um, I know people don't believe this, but L.A. County has the highest rates of infection in the country right now. In the country? In the country. Oh, I thought it was just California. 
Well, we have a lot of people. So, and it could be a lot worse. Yeah. Right? Uh, the good news is, is that um, we have plenty of capacity to deal with everything. So uh, I just, like, I, I can't remember where I said it, but because we don't have a, sac a sacramental component to our worship, um, I think we should, we'd be better off to continue to do things the way we are only because it's going to be such a drag to come together and not be able to come together. Right. We're used to hugging each other and holding hands and right. singing and dancing and snacking together afterwards. Snack. Yeah. Cause, I mean, six foot apart is, I think, I think that works out to about 25 seats. Okay. And uh, so, you know, there'll have to be a lottery and you'll have to have a ticket and, you know, if someone shows up, We'll have to say no, and um, that s sucks. To be honest with you. Yeah. But um, but you know, we, the truth is, is, we could probably open it up because I do know that some of our seniors don't have internet, for instance. Right. So maybe it's time to think about some accommodation that way. Um, okay. But uh, we're getting, we're going to be having a prac meeting soon, and uh, but you know I have like a ten item checklist. So you're going to have to take, yeah. If you get your temperature taken and you're above 103, you can't come in. If you don't have a mask, we'll give you a mask, but bring a mask the next time. Here's a hand sanitizer for your room, for your hands. Uh, don't touch anything going in. Keep your hands to yourself. S sit down. You know, uh, and then when we leave, you know, we'll have to fill it, go to the furthest most seat to the front and fill oh, and back, right? And then, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, from back to front and then leave from front to back. And don't touch anything and here's some more stuff. And uh, don't go into the fellowship hall. Yeah. And then the bathroom, you know, wash your hands for 20 seconds. You know, uh, Woo. yeah, yeah, because right. you know, it's like a real thing, you know, it is. we'd love for it to not be. Yeah, and but it would be so heartbreaking to let the defenses down too early or at all and then suffer the consequences of like, oh my gosh, I've, you know, I wasn't symptomatic, let's say, and I, but I infected this person and now they're sick and now that you know their life is threatened that would be terrible well it and it would be pretty hard to you know to prove all that of course but I, I, I would hate for our center to be a little epicenter where five or six people got sick yeah we, nobody died you know this thing is uh by all accounts for, for those who do get sick it's pretty gnarly yeah and so even if you don't die it can jack you up pretty good. For so, a long time. It has a, a very long yeah. healing so, process. Anyway, but, you know, Dr. Mary Helen, you know, she's had it and survived. Mm -hmm. and she's doing okay. And I'm doing better than okay. And, so um, it is possible. And we still just have to do all we can to protect each other, not just okay. ourselves. Right. Like protect other people just in case and so there's that empathy again that we need to like activate the energy empathy gene <laughs> in all the humans right. and uh, that would help a lot i think but it would be cool you know we'll see what the numbers are this week you know if they start to you know come down yeah it would be cool to be able to meet on you know july 4th and yeah. stay, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, I, I, th I think sometime in the summer is realistic. Yeah. And I don't know how we're going to do it yet. I don't know if we'll go back to okay. services right away or, you know, how that's going to work. Well, I guess we've got time to figure it out. 
Get all in right. The well, garage. I, I think we've covered all we can for this episode. Yep. And uh, for anybody still watching, uh, subscribe if you haven't already to the CSLGH YouTube channel so that you will be alerted when the video is uploaded um, from our next conversation with Salam and Nancy Woods and any other guests that we happen to have. And uh, our next episode of Thoughts on Tops and the Wednesday Meditation. You'll get an alert if you subscribe for that and the Sunday service, of course. So thanks for joining us and see you next week. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, you have to stop the recording. I tried to do it for you. Okay. <laughs> Bye, folks. Bye, Milena. Bye, Rev. Ha, ha, ha.